Hey, do you ever struggle to believe that God is really in control when it seems like so much of your life or the world seems like he's not? I don't know what your world looks like today, but um, maybe you have everything in place. Maybe everything has found its place. Maybe all your ducks are in a row and you're here today and go, man, my life is in order. I mean, it's, I'm just, I'm great. I'm doing great. And y'all are laughing because we all bring our stuff here, don't we? I just got back from uh, getaway weekend with our students where um, we heard last night, uh, one of our teenagers shared a testimony of how she lost her mom. Uh, early on uh, to cancer and how the Lord has redeemed all that he's allowed in that and how hard it was and how difficult and challenging and how the Lord's still redeeming, bringing families together and just all that he does. And, and I'm going to go off script here because this morning, Stacy and I woke up to the news early this morning that one of our dear, dear friends in our church, um, they have a daughter who has two young children, and uh, she, she died of cancer. And we got the news this morning. It was like a gut punch. And um, I was heading out the door, and Stace got the news and just started weeping. And we just are so sad this morning. And um, so I share that because sometimes you come into worship, and you just go, Lord... I want to believe all this, right? I believe and I do believe this. Help me with my unbelief, right? And all of us come with varied challenges and our life is, is chaotic and things happen that don't really make sense. But it's why you're here this morning, isn't it? It really is. We're here like you're saying, Lord, I just I need to be reminded again of how much you love me. I need to be reminded again that you really are in control of my life. Because so often it doesn't look like he is. We're going to talk about that today. That's what these covenants are. Even the covenants, have you picked up on this? Have you been with us? And some of you are brand new today. But each covenant that we look at is like a, like a stepping stone that takes us all the way to Jesus. It's, it's a way to watch the redemptive story of Christ that, that's played out in the new covenant that we're going to look at next week. And with the Lord's Supper that the Lord said, this is a new covenant. I'm bringing to you. It's the one that all of these other covenants are pointing to because each covenant is made. God says, here's what I'm going to do. And his people let him down. He goes, all right, there's something else that's coming. And sometimes in life, we just have to hold on because we go, Lord, this doesn't make sense. This does not make sense. But I'm going to trust you in it. And that is so challenging, isn't it? So our students are having a great time at Getaway. They had a... Um, Silent disco last night, if you've ever been a part of that, it's wild. Um, everybody's got their own headset, there's different music going on, it's crazy. People talk about how, you know, Baptists can't dance. I'm like, no, nah, we can dance. Um, not very well, but we dance. Like, we, I mean, really. And um, it was, you know, they're having a blast. Um, and just all that's happening there, continue to pray for them. They're heading back kind of mid, midday today, but the Lord has, has been at work and man, I believe in this next generation. I mean, they are hungry for God. And they are, and it's not like, y'all, someday you're going to be the church. They are the church. And in so many ways, uh, our students, our young people are leading the way. And it's, it's just been a lot of fun. So today we're going to talk about order. Okay, that's where all this, this lands. We're going to talk about, we're using the word order. Think, think reign and rule over your life. And all of us trying to get order into our lives. And we seek it through different avenues, okay? Um, a lot of us are really needing some order in our lives. Like the moment we, we, we think, well, this thing will bring me order or peace. There's another word, comfort, control, rest, finally. Uh, I need a new job. And you finally get it and your life suddenly got really complicated, right? Or some of you are like, man, I just, if I could just date somebody, prove that I'm date worthy and have, have somebody I could, hey, Valentine's coming up. If I could just have, and then you start dating someone, life just got really disordered when it was kind of pretty much in order. Young family wants to have a child. Bam, disorder all of a sudden. And a different pecking order, we call it. We want order. 
But we end up with disorder. We, we can't seem to get it right, can we? We have a love-hate relationship with order. And today we're going to talk about how the Lord brings order into our lives. We even have a thing for those of us who really are kind of hyper obsessed with order. Um, we call it, a, it's a disorder. We have an obsessive compulsive disorder. We, we just can't quite figure it out. And we, we end up, we want order, but not too much order. See, that's the other thing, right? We don't want imposed order on us. And so we find ourselves in a certain order and in a place where, where we, we just can't seem to get it right. And what we're going to see today is that God brings order into our lives in ways that we don't anticipate. Okay? So as we've said, we've been talking about the promises of God. We've, if you haven't been with us, we've looked at the Adamic promise that comes in Genesis 3. And all of these, again, point to, to Jesus who's coming. We looked at the Abraham or the Noahic promise. Remember the bow, finding that God has said, I'm not going to bring my wrath to my people anymore. The bow is pointed up. The arrow is shooting up, not down to us. We looked at the Abrahamic promise. Last week, we looked at the Noah, I mean, the Mosaic promise, the covenant. And today we're going to look at the Davidic covenant. Okay. If you don't know about David, you can't really fully understand the story of God and Israel and all this taking place, how Christ comes from his lineage. Uh, David's a big deal, and you probably know that. So turn to 2 Samuel 7. If you were thrown off this week, you're reading through our dwell reading, and Fridays are always the text for the sermon. Okay, So it's like, what am I doing in 2 Samuel 7? Because that's always the text. Every week as you're walking through dwell, you have your dwell journal. You can even bring with it, gang, bring your Bible this is the text. We always say it for this course. All right. So bring your Bible. You can bring your journal as well. There's a place where you can take notes on Sundays. So you can dive in there. And then we're going to talk about three ways because we don't get it wrong, right. And we've got all kinds of convoluted ways to figure out how to bring control into our lives. I'm going to, I'm going to go at it this way. Three things that God doesn't uh, mean or, or, or bring when we think uh, he's going to bring order into my life. Okay. The first one is that God doesn't promise celebrity. Now this will make sense here in a moment. He doesn't promise celebrity. We're going to see he doesn't promise. This is going to be hard to hear. He doesn't promise control. Many of us think if I could take control of my life, I would, it would be in order. How's that going for you? Um, and he doesn't bring comfort. And we're like, Oh no, but isn't, doesn't order bring comfort? Well, we're going to see that there's a twist in all of this, and the Lord does bring order into our lives as we, here it is, surrender our lives to him. And so I want to talk about that today, release our lives to him. So when I'm talking about celebrity here, um, we, 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 we think control will come through our own celebrity. And I use the word because it's a word we use in our culture a lot, but through our own reputation, our own, the approval of others, our own performance. And we rely on that. And what we see with David, here's what's going to happen. David was a man after God's own heart. We'll explain what that means. Because when you look at David's life, a points along the way you go, he's messed up, like wheels off at times. The same with Abraham, the same with all of these Bible heroes. Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. But here in the context of this, we always need context. We, we could argue that David is kind of a celebrity. And, and it's starting to, you know, he's kind of a big deal. I mean, he's killed Goliath. You know that story, right? I mean, his, he's trending upward. He's really popular, so much so that Saul goes after him. He evades Saul coming after him twice. And even spares Saul's life, which tells you a little bit about him, right? He's, he's humble, saying, man, I'm the Lord. I, uh, he's even anointed the king by this time. The prophet Nathan is in his life speaking. We'll see this here. Uh, he is the next king. He's already brought the ark to Jerusalem. Now, that's a thing that he's, he's trying to... Okay, this is where God's presence is. His presence is in the ark, right? So I'm going to bring it. And, and now, he, But he's in a tabernacle. He's in a tent. And so I'm going to build him a house. This is what David is saying. How can I live in my cedar house, this really nice house, and the Lord doesn't have a house? And so David is thinking, uh, maybe, you know, I'm, maybe I am celebrity. I'm, you know, my, my TikTok trending upward, all the things. Everybody's following me, liking me. Maybe I'll build God a house. 
And we're going to make sure that his presence stays right here. Nathan says, you the man, go for it. Then there's the context. God comes to Nathan and says, not so fast. Look at verse eight. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to, the, to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts. Uh, that's a, you could translate this, the God of angel armies. That's pretty legit. Um, there's a song, by the way, that is that. But that's a legit translation of this. The God, look, it's king talking to another king. I'm the God of angel armies. Like, I am the king of kings. Let me, let me remind you. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off uh, all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. That last part sounds like the Abrahamic covenant, doesn't it? I'm going to make your name great. I'm, I'm going to bless you. But what God is doing here, he said, in, in, in essence, hey, hey, not so fast. Dave, ease up. Ease up. Remember. Remember, I took you out. And, and Psalm 73 says this so beautifully. He took him out of the, the sheep pens to shepherd his people Israel. He's saying, I'm the one who did this. I have protected you. I have given you victory. So, so, so watch this. Success is this. Success is God's choosing and God's presence. That is success in life. God's choosing us to be his children for us by faith to enter into that relationship. His presence. We see this in Moses as well. His presence brings success. My presence will go for you, before you. It's Abraham, right? Where am I going? I'll tell you. But I know, but where's the land? Where's my son? What's up? What is, I am with you. Some of us need to hear that today. Because our lives seem completely chaotic and out of order. And God is saying, I am with you. You need to be reminded of this. It's not going to come through our own reputation, our own celebrity, the approval of others. See, what we do, we don't think the way that, that we're, we're going to learn today. And I'm challenging us here. We think if I could just be like that person. We have our own little celebrities in our lives. Like I know that moms, even young dads feel this way. If I could be the super mom. Like that mom, her whole world's in order, evidently. On Instagram, she's got everything in order. My life is crazy. If I could only have his job, this guy that's rising up in our organization, in, in my firm, if I had that job, then I would be something. See, we all have our own little celebrities. We envy people who seem to have a grip. There it is, control over their lives, and their lives are in order, and they're crushing it. And my life is out of whack. I don't know if you can relate to that. But if I could just be like them. So we, we, we look at celebrity. I don't know if you saw this week um, on, on uh, I don't know, a social media platform of some sort. But it was on the news that some guy, some foodie comes into Dallas. Some of y'all would know who this is. And he goes to this you know, random dive of a place like a taco joint or something. And he puts it out, you know, man, this is good, y'all. You know, and, he, and he's going on about how good the food is. And, and the place just blows up. Did y'all see this? Um, and like everybody goes there. I mean, you talk about power. You talk about control of celebrity, right? And then, of course, celebrities can cancel some other celebrities or something. This is the world we live in. One of the things that I think is really interesting. So, you know, next week is the Super Bowl, right? Um, and the Kansas City Chiefs are playing in the Super Bowl. And the 49ers, right? Um, there are going to be more middle school girls watching <laughs> this Super Bowl than ever before. Y'all laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Um, maybe there's a little love story here. I mean, if we could just get five seconds, maybe another five out of the entire game and see Taylor Swift up in the suite. Oh, let's go. <laughs> And, and I mean, some of y'all are going to be watching it just for that. But here's what I've seen. This is really interesting. I have talked to friends of mine. And then I realized, oh, others have seen this too. Because I was, I, was, I was realizing a lot of men are, are, are like, I had a friend of mine legit tell me, and I've, heard, and I've seen this. I, I just want Kansas City to lose because I'm tired of seeing Taylor Swift. <laughs> have y'all seen this? So I'm thinking about that. I'm, hmm. 
And then Carlos Whitaker, who is, is a guy that, that we know, he's, he's actually led worship up here. He, he noted, could it be, he, he said what I was thinking. Um, could it be all these men don't want a celebrity, a woman of power and influence, stepping into their man space? That's another sermon. <laughs> Shake it off, is all I'm saying. <laughs> but the power of celebrity is that we think that if we can be like them and people would love us so much that we're willing to do almost anything to gain the approval of others. We love and we loathe celebrity because when we find ourselves there, then we get canceled, right? But here's what's going on here. David says, I'm going to build him a house. And then what we're going to see here, God is going to step in and say, no, I'm going to, no, I'm going to build you a house. See, God always has another way. God is not going to bring it through celebrity or through the power that we want to bring to it. And, and can I say this before we press on? I've got to say this because a lot of us have found celebrity. That's another, we wouldn't use this term necessarily, in, in political power. One of the ways that we lean often, here's how the kingdom of God is going to come, and it's going to come through political power. Now, we don't, we don't talk about politics here, or I should say, we don't talk about partisan politics here, because we have a king, and we have a kingdom, and we are living in obedience to him. And what's happening in our world, and I'm going to offer this preemptively, in the fall, here's what we're doing. We are going to take a deep dive into the Beatitudes and into the Sermon on the Mount. Because we live in a, in a radically different kingdom. And we're not going to be talking all about partisan politics. This is going to be a safe place for you to come and say, this is getting crazy. Because friends, it's about to get crazy. And we're going to say, you know what? I am a non-anxious presence in this world because I trust in the one who's in control of my life, even though it looks like disorder. Because here's the thing. I see a lot of vocal Christians out there who jump into the fray and they never talk about the Beatitudes. They never talk about the Sermon on the Mount. They enter into all this stuff and, you know, fight with worldly weapons. Many of you remember a guy named Chuck, Chuck Colson. Back in the day, some of you don't remember him. He was in the Nixon administration. He was an advisor, uh, to, political advisor, and he ends up in prison after Watergate. He gets saved. Like he comes to Christ in prison. Radical transformation of his life. Then he starts writing about his, he had a book called Born Again. Um, and, and popularized the phrase even at the time. Though that was, that was Jesus' phrase, by the way. John, if you know John 3, 16 and that, that whole passage. Um, but but he, he wrote this later in his life. When we politicized the church, we may, when we politicized the church, this is back in the 70s, 80s, when we made a grave mistake because we thought we could recover America by getting the right people in office. But the problem, he says, is not in the office. The problem is in the church. So if we turn our attention to ourselves, he goes on, and truly follow Jesus and live like Jesus, that's how we're going to change the world. See, the problem in the church is made evident outside the church when we don't really believe that living like Jesus works in the real world. Many don't have enough faith to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to give someone our cloak, to lay down our lives. And yet that's exactly how Jesus taught us to live. And he did so. He was speaking to a politically oppressed people. He says, you want to live differently? You want to change the world? Here's how you do it. And, and, and yet what we have done, we've turned away from his way. And, and too many Christians believe that the ends justify the means. Yo, hang on to this. This is true in all of our relationships. In, in, in Christianity, okay, following Jesus, the ends, no, how about this? The means justify and produce the ends. Does that make sense? We live like Jesus. That is the end. 
That's how we bring about real change. And so we, we've got to continue to trust in him because we have a very specific code of conduct as Christians. Live just like Jesus. That's it. Don't enter into the powers of this. And I know, I get it. We've got to, you know, somebody's got to vote, all the things. Let's be involved, but let's come into it like Jesus. And that's how we will win others over. If winning in politics or in your relationships or finding this pecking order, if winning in politics becomes more important to us than winning souls for Jesus, and if scolding culture becomes more important than sanctifying the church, we lose because we live in a different kingdom. And so the, our power is not found in, in, in scolding culture. Our power is found in grace and the message of grace lived out in our lives. That's where the power is. Let's remember that. And it's true in your relationships. What are you trusting in these days? What kind of celebrity are you pursuing or what kind of power in the world are you trusting in? What, what does that mean for you? You tend to rely on your reputation, what you've always done, or, or maybe some, some approval that you'll find. How's that working out for you? Because even studies show one dopamine hit, one jolt of dopamine requires another and another and another. And we can't get enough. It's like a drug. Why? Because it's pointing us to something beyond anything that we can do, anything that we might accomplish, any approval we may receive from others, any celebrity we might get. We're not meant to be famous. Think about it. Every person who ever has had esteem, ever been exalted, applauded, liked, all the things. When we think about so many at the top of our, our cultural, you know, celebrity, crazy culture we live in. We find, whether it be, gosh, Michael Jackson. I mean, name them, right? Prince, Robin Williams, and another generation, Elvis, Marilyn Monroe. Why? why? And I know we could talk a lot about mental health and all those things. We're not meant to be famous. God alone is famous. He alone is the one that brings control into our lives. And so he continues to say, tell David this, I will, look at verse 10, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them and that they, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. Notice God does the planting. Somebody needs to hear this today. God has planted you right where you are. Yeah, but I don't want to be here. I want that other job. I need to get to another place in my life. I, want to, I don't want this illness that I'm wrestling with. I don't want to walk through this loss. I'm grieving. I don't want to be here. I want to be elsewhere. God has planted you there. And you've heard it said, bloom where you're planted. Because if it's not this challenge, this disorder, this ease that has come into your life, it'll be another one. Because that's how life goes. And he says, no, no, no. bloom where you're planted. Somebody needs to hear that today. And then it says, and violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time he's going to bring safety. He's going to, yes, bring some security to the people. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest. There it is. From all your enemies. He will bring peace out of the chaos. And he will do this for a season. Right? And he'll do it through David. Because here, this is true. A leader, okay, over a people or any organization... The, a leader can bring, can bring peace or disorder. A leader can bring peace or chaos. And often it's because of the peace or chaos that is within the leader themselves, right? Starts within and then it comes into our lives. This is true for you in your relationships, in your family. We find peace ultimately from God. He's not going to work through celebrity, whether it's us or somebody else. He's going to work through his own spirit in us as we surrender to him. God promised his order. But look at this. He doesn't promise control. And this is counterintuitive. Because many of us, again, if I could just take control of my life. Control is a myth. And so all we can do is continue to trust in him. And here's where this goes. David, you want to build me a house? Watch this. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you you a house. Notice he doesn't say build you a house. I'll make you a house. 
When your days are fulfilled and you lie down from your, uh, with your fathers, that is, when you die, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, from your very own body, and I will establish the kingdom. Now he's talking about something else. This is the Davidic covenant. Now he's saying, okay, it's going to come. I'm going to bring about a dynasty, but not the kind you're thinking of. Not temporal. It is forever, but yes, I'm going to use you through your body. Who built the temple? Anybody? Solomon, his son. It's going to happen. But there's something much bigger going on here that we've got to get our minds around. Now, you know that a house can be a house. It can be a household. It can be a house, like a, like a lineage, like the house of Windsor, okay? Like the royal lineage. That's what we're talking about here. Though I think they're, they're actually all like Germanic or something. But anyway, um, it's, it's, it's a lineage that's coming. And we know this, that Jesus is from the line of David, Right? We see this throughout the, the, the Christmas story. I mean, it's, it's over and over in scripture. So look at verse 13. He, sh- he, now he's talking about Solomon, but Solomon becomes a type of one who is to come. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is where Solomon, like David, we've seen this in all of the covenants. Every one of them becomes a type is the theological term a shadow of what is to come. So yes, I'm doing a thing through you, but not the ultimate thing. And this is true for us as well. The Lord will use us in our season and in the moment, and yet he'll point us to all things eternal as we can have an eternal impact on others. But he says, I will establish a house. Now, on a personal level, what he's saying is our house ultimately We become the temple of God, right? We see in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and he fills us so that our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if we abide in him and we walk with him every day, we seek to to embody his presence in our lives. We abide in him. He says, I'm going to do something that is beyond any physical house. It's a spiritual house, if you will. David himself would say in Psalm 127, if the Lord doesn't build the house, what? The workers labor in vain. The Lord is building a house. He does it with us. He does it collectively. It's his church, this new household that we've talked about. Look at verse 14. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Now, the writer of Hebrews takes that and says he's talking about Jesus, the father, son. But then look at this. Then it twists. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. What does this mean? Again, it's a type. So on the one hand, wait, he's talking about Solomon. Wait, hold on. He's talking about Jesus. What what are we talking about here? And, And the writer of Hebrews says, yes, although he was a son, he learned, it says he learned obedience. He experienced obedience through suffering. So the perfect one is now the writer of Hebrews chapter five. He says he experienced suffering for us, but then he says, and being, being perfect, being made perfect. Okay. Experiencing suffering and yet obedient, he became the source, which he was already perfect, the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, to all who follow after him. He says, he's, this is pointing to Jesus. This is pointing to Jesus. And to David's credit, okay, he knows that it's through him that there's going to be established this, this, this dynasty to come. He knows it. In fact, he talks about a king to come in other, uh, others of his psalms, and it's not him. He knows that God is doing something bigger, but what he's doing here, it's a kind of metaphysical retirement planning that's going on. He has brought the ark to, to, uh, to Jerusalem. He wants to build a temple for God because you can imagine, he's thinking if we could have the place where God would reside, then he would bless us and bless his people. We need a place. And God is saying, yes, okay, good. I got bigger plans. And it's coming in the person of Jesus because what he will bring to us, back to this, y'all, listen, choosing us to be his sons and daughters, filling us with his presence as the temples, if you will, of the Holy Spirit, then that brings peace and order into our lives. Shalom is the word. And to those around us, not through celebrity, not through control, finally, God doesn't bring promise uh, I mean, he doesn't promise, he promises order, but he doesn't, 
promised comfort. Now, this is a good word for me today. For us who've received some challenging news, and maybe you're walking through a very challenging season. God doesn't promise comfort. He promises something better. We want comfort. He's going to bring something better. What is it? But my steadfast love will not depart from him. My steadfast love will not depart from you, from your son, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. I'm in charge of this. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. This is something else going on. Your throne shall be established forever. We see this even in Isaiah, other places, that he shall reign forever and ever, and the government shall be upon his shoulders in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision all and more. I think Nathan spoke to David. So all this, right? He goes and tells David all of this. But if you know anything about David's life, this blessing, okay, the Davidic covenant that he reveals to David Doesn't mean that now David's life is now up and to the right and totally comfortable. And this should should remind us that God is at work through whatever we're going through, whatever you face today. And again, I have I I, I've been so encouraged today by worshiping, singing these songs together, and we're gonna close our time with a song that will remind us that it's not by our own power, it's not by might, but it's by his spirit in us, in you. And we're going we're to get there. But what happens in David's life, you might know that Absalom, his son, rebels against him. He has another son who tries to take over Solomon's reign. And we know that David, call it what you will, he violates a woman, powers up, assaults her, and then he ends up killing her husband. And David is a man after God's own heart? What is up with that? See, David had... All these moments where it was crazy. And if you've experienced this in your dwell reading, if you've been reading through Genesis with us, and I I would challenge all of us to do so. We talked about this in our pastor study this past Wednesday night. You come to, you go, you see, often we hear stories like this. Hey, Noah rescued his family and then he worshiped God. Be like Noah. Hey, Abraham, he was amazing. He had a man of faith. Be like Abraham. Even David, David was, he killed Goliath, kill your giants, be like David. And which again is another way of saying, y'all, listen, be like these heroes of the Bible, go, work harder, get better. And we leave church going, man, I'm nothing like, no. But how about this, Noah, then he gets drunk. Abraham lying about Sarah And what about David and his craziness? Don't be like these men. That's the message, really, right? So what's going on here? Who's the hero? We talk about these biblical heroes. God is the hero. And God is showing us today, He's showing you and me that he works through sinful people like us. Why does he do that? That's all he's got. Praise be to God. Be encouraged today because some of us, we're we're like, I'm not worthy if a lot of us are tripped up. Guilt and shame. And I just can't quite get past it all for God to use me. Listen, I don't deserve it. Yep, you don't deserve it. It's a response to his grace, right? And by the way, a man after God's own heart. Take a deep dive into the Hebrew there. And we know, you might have heard this before, in Hebrew... The, the word heart really is, we would, we would probably translate it uh, mind or will. It was the, the center of the person, the heart, the mind, the will of the person. So to say that he was a man after God's own heart is to say that he was a man after God's own mind and his will. Another way of saying God chose David by his own will for his own purposes, not because of his moral behavior. Not because he was this supreme paragon of morality. Because he wasn't. You know what he did have going for him? Because I've wrestled with it. Why did he choose him then? Because David was willing to repent of his sin. That's why. He pulled him out of the sheep pens. Why did he choose him? Because he chose him. 
<laughs> Why did he choose Israel? Because he chose Israel. Why did he choose you and me? Because he chose you and me. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his love for us. And so many of you here today, you might think that, man, I don't have enough to bring. Some of you are not serving the Lord because you think, I, once I'm to a level of spirituality, and that will never come, friends. Just telling you, you need to surrender your life. Some of you need to, to give what you have to the Lord. I don't know. That makes me uncomfortable. We will guard our comfort with everything we've got and miss the blessings of God. Some of us need to be serving. We need to be stepping out from where we are. We need to have that conversation with that person. And the spirit is leading you. And he says, I got you. I got you. Trust in me. And he's doing that now. And some of you here today, and we have friends like this. Maybe you're watching. Maybe you're here in the room. I tried Christianity or how about that? I'm trying it. It's not working out for me. Because again, you've turned it into a contract. Lord, if I do this, why don't you come through? And it's a covenant. The gospel is a one-way covenant, meaning I've got you regardless of what you do. And that doesn't make sense for us because we sign contracts. And if you don't come through, we're going to repo your car. We're going to foreclose on your house. We're going to take your money. We're going to garnish your wages. And we think the Lord works that way. But instead, he's taken all that and he's put it upon Christ, the one who should have been celebrity, (laughs) The one who deserves to be famous. The one who should have been given control over all things, right? Who should be comfortable. Instead, he was tortured. He should be ruling and reigning over the hearts of people. Instead, he submits himself. Philippians 2. This is the kingdom of God. He becomes Not just a human. He had all those things. Celebrity, control, comfort. He becomes one of us so that he would take on the punishment that should have come to us. And he releases himself. He releases his control. He releases his comfort. He releases his celebrity. And he says, I'm doing it all for the sake of those who think they need all of these things. And then he gives it to us freely because we cannot achieve these things. And yet we continue to try, don't we? And so then in Ephesians chapter one, this vertical invasion of the kingdom of God through Jesus, Paul says this, that Christ was raised from the dead and God, the father seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, place of all control, all authority. If you say all celebrity, for above all, for far above all rule, authority and power, dominion, a name that is above every name. Not only here it is, not only in this age, but the age to come forever and ever. It means that we are to put all things under him. He says, put everything under his feet. He gave him as head over all things. And, and he says, and especially the church. That we are his people, we bow down before him, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all of us in all ways, he says. And friends, today the reminder is that we have an eternal king. And if you have trusted him with your salvation, with your eternity, can I remind you, you can trust him with whatever you're going through right now. Because it is small in comparison to what he has already accomplished for us. So I can stand here and worship the Lord today. I'm down here in the early hour with Stacy. We're just worshiping the Lord through tears. And some of you are there. And we don't like to cry in worship. People think we're crazy. But we can bring all that we are to the Lord. And we come here broken because we believe, God, that you really are at work. Remind me again of how much you love me. I give you my life. Friends, remember this this week, and we're going to close and proclaim it together. It's not by your might. It's not by your power or anybody else's power. Thus says the Lord, by my spirit. So the crew's coming out because we're going to sing a song. They're going to sing a song over us, and then we'll join them. But we wanted to enter into this week with the reminder that God really is at work in our lives. But here, here's the hard part for us, but you can do it. When you understand how much he loves you, all that he's done for you, that he has forever kingdom that's coming, and we are in it now.
We're living in it. He says, you can trust me, so surrender your life to me. I'm up to things that you cannot see. Let me remind you how much I love you. I'm with you. That is success. Okay? So I'm going to pray over us, and then Han's going to come and guide us into this last part. Don't rush out. Just let this speak into your heart. And as we do, just surrender to him. Just bow your heads and close your eyes. And You've heard a lot. How are you trusting in celebrity, maybe yourself, your reputation, your work, your, your control over things in your life? How's that going for you? Maybe you're relying on others more than you should for your worth, identity, control. Maybe you're pursuing comfort more than you should. It's got you not taking any risk, not stepping out to love, serve, and be there for others. Maybe that's the challenge. Maybe you need to release control and surrender. Maybe you've never given your life fully to him. Maybe today is the day. But all of us, more and more, Lord, we give you our lives. We surrender ourselves to your plan, which goes beyond anything we can imagine. We want to build a house. You've got something much bigger for us. And we praise you for that. We thank you for Jesus. And the reminder that it's not by our own power or by might, but by your spirit. In your name we pray.